Welcome to Open Source Spotlight. We invite open source authors and ask them to show the tools they are working on. And today we have Maciej. Hi, Maciej. Please tell us a few words about yourself and about the tool you want to show us. Yeah, sure. So my name is Maciej Mazur. I'm the principal AI engineer in Canonical. Canonical is the publisher of Ubuntu, which you might already know, the Linux distribution. But actually, we are also contributing to many different open source projects like OpenStack, Kubernetes, and uh, most importantly for today, Kubeflow. And my team is mostly uh, focused on that part, like MLOps and data platforms. And today I wanted to present to you Kubeflow pipelines and how the tooling and automation that we contribute to the community helps you to connect it with various different uh, MLOps components like MLflow, like starting a pipeline from notebooks and so on. That's really cool. Want to see that? Okay, awesome. So uh, the demo for today is running of a GCP instance. You can also deploy the tooling into basically any kind of Kubernetes cluster, which is CNCF compliant. Uh, Kubeflow itself is a CNCF project, so obviously uh, that would and should work nicely. Uh, what now is that? We are... CNC... What is that? Yeah, CN... CNCF are the Kubernetes people, basically. That's the open source community that is uh, maintaining uh, Kates and all the cloud native projects that are around uh, the CN... system. So... CN is cloud native, uh, yeah. something, right? Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, you can meet all of those nice people at KubeCon in Amsterdam going to happen pretty soon. I, I'll be showing the keynote there on like usage of Kubeflow in uh, healthcare space uh, or life sciences more than healthcare. So that might be interesting. So let's uh, jump right in. in. On that instance, we have microcades deployed, which is uh, basically CNCF compliant Kubernetes cluster, easy to deploy with a single command on any machine. And Kubeflow itself is running there. So this is how the UI looks like. There are multiple different components. So Kubeflow is not a single open source project. It's actually a collection of different projects. You have Katib doing the uh, experiments in AutoML. You have tensor boards, notebooks, and many different things uh, put together behind the single authentication and network connectivity to make it easier for data scientists who are not like DevOps experts or like don't play a lot with Kubernetes and want to actually just use the tool to make the job done. And if we look uh, into the notebooks tab, we will see that there is a notebook running and whenever you want to create a new one, uh, the additional thing that we contributed here is an opportunity to basically add integrations. Like here today, I'll be demoing the MLflow one. Uh, which is model monitoring and model repository uh, part, and Minio, which is S3 storage. You can use any, but that's like the open source one and the one that I'm typically using. So you can click connect here to connect to the notebook server, and then you are getting uh, access to your notebooks. What's interesting there is that typically what you will get from a data scientist would be a notebook that is used for training the model itself. So let's try to start from the beginning and run it. So uh, the dependencies I installed previously. So mm -hmm. here is the notebook that you will typically get from a data scientist. So they will give you some idea as an MLOps engineer that what you would have to do, like download the data, train the model, make an inference. But what you would actually get is just a list of dependencies that you can install. Typically, a link to some S3 bucket or to a file. In this demo, to simplify stuff, it's just a CSV file uh, hosted somewhere. And then you have your data preprocessing. In this case, again, to make it simple and easy to understand, we are focusing on the pipelines. We are just replacing some characters in the data set and running the model training. So here we can see already that uh, inside here, we have the MLflow uh, auto log function to log the training and its results into MLflow. So you don't need to put any kind of authentication, all the parameters and everything happens through the integration that is available there in Kubeflow. So that's, that's really you can cool. actually use multiple tools without worrying about like where it is, what's the IP, is my TLS set up, is everything secure? So everything like that is there. And you the just whole- just import MLflow and that's it. You don't yes. need to set- anything else that's cool I'm trying to make it big enough but basically you can see your training runs that here the font will be smaller because the ui is a bit more complex uh, but you can take your runs 
and compare them between each other, see the different parameters that were used for the training and what are the actual results, if it makes any sense, which run is better. So that's super useful from the tooling perspective. But obviously, no one will realistically run this training, for example, hourly or weekly or daily like this, going to a notebook and running through the cells and executing them. So that makes no sense. And that's why we have Kubeflow pipelines, the main tool that I want to showcase here. So what we will be doing right now is using a notebook. You can also use your favorite IDE or any kind of editor. Let's not start the Vim versus Emacs war, but basically you can write it in Python to define how the pipeline should be built. So uh, here, what we are doing is basically importing the KFP package. This is a domain-specific language for Kubeflow that allows you to uh, build pipelines programmatically. So obviously, if you are in an air gapped environment and trying that, you have to download this data set locally. Uh, now I'll download it here manually. And here you are starting to use the helpers that are coming from the community. So Kubeflow pipelines has a lot of pre-made components, which are useful building the pipelines, like downloading files. Everyone is doing that. It doesn't make sense really to ask each and every pipeline builder to create their own. So there are components like web downloader that you can define. There are also functions that you will have to define yourself, like data preprocessing. Uh, in our case, swapping characters. Obviously, this will be different data set to data set and project to project. So your preprocessing is a step that you define by yourself and basically define the operation. What function should be run? What's the input data? What's the output data? And which packages and which base Docker image you want to use? So coming back to the image, the Docker image here uh, is coming from the fact that each and every step in Kubeflow pipelines is a separate pod that will be scheduled on your case cluster. So you can actually make this workflow in a more elaborated way running in parallel many steps. Like if you have a stream of videos, you can uh, split it into frames. Each frames, each frame object detection could be a separate pod that is being run or any kind of way that you want it to be built. And the training of the model, again, this is something that we will define uh, manually. This is the same code that we got from our data scientists. So as ML engineers, we can just paste it here and define it as a training function. And whenever we have our uh, components defined, uh, we can also add the deploy model component, which is using Seldon. Seldon is part of Kubeflow, and it allows you to define basically a pod that will be used for the serving with HTTP endpoint where you have a health check and the endpoint where you can actually ping the model and get uh, your prediction that you want. Uh, creating the pipeline, now we are mashing it up all together. So basically defining that the pipeline consists of these four steps uh, with that particular setup and create a run. So what's also convenient, whenever you create it, you get your experiment details and run details here. You can click it and it will open you the standard Kubeflow pipeline CY and you can see the pipeline execution uh, whenever it's there. Uh, so yeah, it takes some time because the GCP machine is not that big. So we can see that the pipeline already started executing. Uh, the download data step finished. We can see the parameters uh, which were used from where the data is being downloaded and all the other steps are commencing forward. So what we can do with that right now when we have a pipeline and automation, we can make scheduled pipeline runs. We can make the pipeline to actually run and be triggered by an external event or an action. And we can also see since the pipeline is hooked uh, with MLflow, uh, since we run it again, we can already see that we have additional experiments available here in the tab uh, for the runs that we created right now. And uh, every time the pipeline will run, we are able to see the parameters which were used and how good the model did during that part particular training. You can also hook it up to get additional metrics about model drift and data drift and any kind of uh, things that you want to actually monitor and you know make sure that your MLOps setup is running correctly. So that's more or less it for like the quick intro. Uh, do you have any questions? I do. Yes, I'm looking at this. So it looks like uh, so Kubeflow pipeline pipelines is a workflow orchestrator, right? So it allows us to schedule 
to define a workflow which is a sequence uh, or a direct acyclic graph of multiple steps, right? And then execute these steps in order. So I'm wondering what's the main benefit of using Kubeflow compared to other tools like, I don't know, Airflow or Prefect or like, you know, this more classical, let's say, uh, data pipeline tools. So Kubeflow yeah. actually also uses a classical tool in the background. It uses Argo uh -huh. for the workflows. Uh, so the benefit here uh, that I see with Kubeflow is that the fact that this is integrated with the rest of the ecosystem out of the box. So as I said, we are using a method in order to uh, hook it up to other components like S3 storages, like MLflow and for example, Spark and all the other tools that you might get. So uh, let me show you how it looks like. Not sure how well it's visible, so I can make it a bit bigger. Uh, so this is the deployment that we actually have on the GCP machine that uh, I shared. What do we have here? The, all the components that are here, like Kati, Kubeflow Pipelines, Minio, MLflow, are orchestrated with a tool called Juju and Charms that we develop. And with that, uh, you have the full orchestration across Kubernetes clusters. You get access to GPUs, even in more complex scenarios, whenever you have like a couple of data science teams working together, which sometimes looks pretty funny if you go to like a huge life sciences companies making uh, medicine for everyone in the planet. And you see that they have a big whiteboard with all the GPUs listed and people put sticky notes like who is using this today. Uh, so normally uh, what you can do, you can use Kubernetes with additional schedulers because the default one is not that great with GPUs like uh, Unicorn or Volcano or whichever you prefer. And then you are able to use vGPU, SMIG, and grid computing and different stuff from NVIDIA allowing you to slice or pull GPUs together. Kubeflow is aware of all of this. And whenever you do training or you want to schedule certain pods to run or components of the pipeline, all of those pods will be workload placed in the correct way and use your infra. So I think that that's the biggest benefit. I mean, if you have a small environment and you know training between you and your colleague, maybe it's not that beneficial, it's just yet another pipelining tool. But if you start getting big, this makes mm -hmm. more and more sense. Okay. And uh, I think in your demo, the most difficult part is actually not running the demo, but the setup you did before the demo. So I'm wondering oh, yes. if there is any resource that you can uh, point to with, that explains how you actually prepared everything. Yeah, sure. So basically, there is the whole guide on how to deploy and install it. And it's called the uh, Kubeflow Quick Start for the Charm Kubeflow. So if you go back to uh, the Charm Kubeflow website, which is charm-kubeflow.io, uh, in the documentation section, uh, you can see the whole, like, how to start and how to install. Uh, and it has all the steps, just like in any kind of tutorial on how to set it up on your local machine, how to make the dashboard accessible. And as you can see, this is fairly short because if you have Juju deployed, the whole installation is just a uh, uh, surprising way shorter than I expected. Yes. So the whole thing that we are doing is basically taking the learnings that we got from Ubuntu. As you know, it's simple and easy to use installing packages, just up to install something in a very complex Kubernetes application with 30 components, it's also as simple as that. So that, that's what we contribute basically to the community. We will make sure to include this link in the description. And now I have a few questions about this project. So I know Kubeflow is a huge project. And uh, the question I usually ask is how many people are working on this? But I don't know if you can actually answer that because I know it's like thousands or quite a lot, right, for Kubeflow. Well, there are many people involved in Kubeflow in general. There are several bigger companies contributing. There are our colleagues from like Aricto, from Google. Obviously, Canonical is contributing there. Uh, our team is like uh, dedicated engineering is eight people plus mm -hmm. field engineers who are actually deploying that and making all of those notebooks and automation. That's again, another like 20 people. So. Uh, but in total, the community would be 200 to 300 people in size in terms of contributors and tons of users who are actually super valuable because they contribute like ideas for documentation, tutorials, and that kind of stuff. And that's hard to judge. I, I'm not really sure how many people are mm -hmm. doing that. 
And if somebody who is watching this video wants to contribute to you either by using it or, I don't know, by actually doing some code, what's the best way of getting started? So if you want to start contributing, like in any software project, I would encourage you to go, just go on GitHub, uh, find Charmed Kubeflow there and see what are the open bugs. If something is easy and you see that you can fix it, that's a nice way to get familiar with it. If you want to contribute more from a user perspective, you can take the tutorial, go over it and try to basically build a notebook, win a Kaggle competition with it, write a blog post about it, make some more noise. We always need more people in the community, so that would be an awesome way to start. And you mentioned Charmed Kubeflow. I think uh, maybe can you tell us uh, what it is like and how it's related to you? Kubeflow. So Chunk Kubeflow is just a distribution. So in the same way as Ubuntu is a distribution of Linux. Mm -hmm. So basically we uh, work together with the community to wrap and package the components uh, of Kubeflow in order to make the installation really like one single command instead of applying tons of Helm charts. And we are maintaining the images, like the base images that are used for the installation. So the operating system, Python, CUDA, and so on, and CVE patch them and publish them in publicly available repositories. So everyone can have like consume open source in a secure manner, not just some like very old images never patched and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good explanation. Now I understand. Like it's like Ubuntu to Linux. That's uh, that explains everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last one. Do you have any advice to anyone who is watching this? Any advice? Well, actually, I would advise everyone who is a developer or a DevOps practitioner or any kind of engineer to take a look at what's happening right now with general AI ML space, because this year, I think, will be very uh, big and important for us in terms of a lot of changes happening. Like there is obviously some like marketing hype with ChatGPT and BART and all the fun stuff with large language models. But actually, the multimodal models coming in and the business applications of that will make it even more and more popular. And the, there is a huge hunger for talent everywhere. Everyone is hiring, and that's like an, uh, the best moment to get into this space if you are interested. And I assume you are since you are watching this uh, mm -hmm. episode. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I promised it would be the last question, but I cannot help but ask you this one. What operating system are you using right now? Ah, right now I'm using a Mac because it looks nice on the <laughs> webinars and presentations like that. But obviously, uh, I uh, the, that. the demo that you can see here uh, is run on the machine running Ubuntu on GCP. So you work at a canonical. What do they think about you using a Mac? Well, that's simple. Like all the tools that we use for the recordings, like Zoom, they don't really work well with Linux <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. So that's the most efficient way to share your screen without everything crashing. Okay. <laughs> well, we can cut this out, but I think it would be fun if we keep no, it. No, so it's super what... funny and everyone is okay with that and everyone knows <laughs> okay. what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so thanks a lot, Machi, for joining us today, for doing the demo, awesome demo, and I'm surprised how simple that was, simple and powerful, so thanks a lot for doing it today. And uh, yeah, I know you have more products in um, Kubeflow, in the Kubeflow ecosystem, so mm -hmm. yeah. We'll be happy to have you again presenting something else. Yeah, sure. It would be awesome. Thank you for an invitation and an opportunity uh, to show people what we are doing. Okay, then um, see you soon.